Volume One, Chapter Ten of Travels in the Interior of Africa by Mungo Park. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Moorish Wedding. The Moors, though very indolent themselves, are rigid taskmasters and keep every person under them in full employment. My boy Demba was sent to the woods to collect withered grass for Ali's horses, and after a variety of projects concerning myself, they at last found out an employment for me. This was no other than the respectable office of barber. I was to make my first exhibition in this capacity in the royal presence, and to be honored with the task of shaving the head of the young prince of Ludamar. I accordingly seated myself upon the sand, and the boy, with some hesitation, sat down beside me. A small razor, about three inches long, was put into my hand, and I was ordered to proceed, but whether from my own want of skill, or the improper shape of the instrument, I unfortunately made a slight incision in the boy's head at the very commencement of the operation, and the king, observing the awkward manner in which I held the razor, concluded that his son's head was in very improper hands, and ordered me to resign the razor and walk out of the tent. This I considered as a very fortunate circumstance for I had laid it down as a rule to make myself as useless and insignificant as possible, as the only means of recovering my liberty. March 18th. Four Moors arrived from Jara with Johnson, my interpreter, having seized him before he had received any intimation of my confinement and bringing with them a bundle of clothes that I had left at Daman Jumba's house, for my use in case I should return by the way of Jara. Johnson was led into Ali's tent and examined. The bundle was opened, and I was sent for to explain the use of the different articles. I was happy, however, to find that Johnson had committed my papers to the charge of one of Damon's wives. When I had satisfied Ali's curiosity respecting the different articles of apparel, the bundle was again tied up and put into a large cowskin bag that stood in a corner of the tent. The same evening Ali sent three of his people to inform me that there were many thieves in the neighborhood and that to prevent the rest of my things from being stolen it was necessary to convey them all into his tent my clothes instruments and everything that belonged to me were accordingly carried away and though the heat and dust made clean linen very necessary and refreshing i could not procure a single shirt out of the small stock i had brought along with me Ali was, however, disappointed by not finding among my effects the quantity of gold and amber that he expected, but to make sure of everything he sent the same people on the morning following to examine whether I had anything concealed about my person. They, with their usual rudeness, searched every part of my apparel and stripped me of all my gold amber my watch and one of my pocket compasses i had fortunately in the night buried the other compass in the sand and this with the clothes i had on was all that the tyranny of ali had now left me the gold and amber were highly gratifying to moorish advice but the pocket compass soon became an object of superstitious curiosity. Ali was very desirous to be informed why that small piece of iron, the needle, always pointed to the great desert, and I found myself somewhat puzzled to answer the question. To have pleaded my ignorance would have created a suspicion that I wished to conceal the real truth from. 
i therefore told him that my mother resided far beyond the sands of the sahara and that whilst she was alive the piece of iron would always point that way and serve as a guide to conduct me to her and that if she was dead it would point to her grave ali now looked at the compass with redoubled amazement turned it round and round repeatedly but observing that it always pointed the same way he took it up with great caution and returned it to me manifesting that he thought there was something of magic in it and that he was afraid of keeping so dangerous an instrument in his possession march twentieth this morning a council of chief men was held in ali's tent respecting me their decisions though they were all unfavorable to me were differently related by different persons some said they intended to put me to death others that i was only to lose my right hand but the most probable account was that which i received from ali's own son a boy about nine years of age who came to me in the evening and with much concern informed me that his uncle had persuaded his father to put out my eyes which they said resembled those of a cat and that all the bushreens had approved of his measure his father however he said would not put the sentence into execution until fatima the queen who was at present in the north had seen me march twenty first anxious to know my destiny i went to the king early in the morning and as a number of bushreens were assembled i thought this a favorable opportunity of discovering their intentions i therefore began by begging his permission to return to jara which was flatly refused his wife he said had not yet seen me and i must stay until she came to benoam after which i should be at liberty to depart and that my horse which had been taken away from me the day that after i arrived should be again restored to me unsatisfactory as this answer was i was forced to appear pleased and as there was little hope of making my escape at this season of the year on account of the excessive heat and the total want of water in the woods i resolved to wait patiently until the rains had set in or until some more favorable opportunity should present itself but hope deferred maketh this heart sick this tedious procrastination from day to day and the thoughts of traveling through the negro kingdoms in the rainy season which was now fast approaching made me very melancholy and having passed a restless night i found myself attacked in the morning by a smart fever i had wrapped myself close up in my cloak with a view to induce perspiration and was asleep when a party of moors entered the hut and with their usual rudeness pulled the cloak from me i made signs to them that i was sick and wished much to sleep but i solicited in vain my distress was matter of sport to them and they endeavored to heighten it by every means in their power in this perplexity i left my hut and walked to some shady trees at a little distance from the camp where i lay down but even here persecution followed me and solitude was thought too great an indulgence for a distressed christian ali's son with a number of horsemen came galloping to the place and ordered me to rise and follow them i begged they would allow me to remain where i was if it were only for a few hours but they paid little attention to what i said and after a few threatening words one of them pulled out a pistol from a leather bag that was fastened to the pommel of his saddle 
and presenting it towards me snapped it twice he did this with so much indifference that i really doubted whether the pistol was loaded he cocked it a third time and was striking the flint with a piece of steel when i begged them to desist and returned with them to the camp when we entered ali's tent we found him much out of humor he called for the moor's pistol and amused himself for some time with opening and shutting the pan at length taking up his powder horn he fresh primed it and turning round to me with a menacing look said something in arabic which i did not understand i desired my boy who was sitting before the tent to inquire what offence i had committed when i was informed that having gone out of the camp without ali's permission they suspected that i had some design of making my escape and that in future if i was seen without the skirts of the camp orders had been given that i should be shot by the first person that observed me in the afternoon the horizon to the eastward was thick and hazy and the moors procrastinated a sand wind which accordingly commenced on the morning following and lasted with slight intermission for two days the force of the wind was not in itself very great it was what a seaman would have denominated a stiff breeze but the quantity of sand and dust carried before it was such as to darken the whole atmosphere about this time all the women of the camp had their feet and the ends of their fingers stained of a dark saffron color i could never ascertain whether this was done from the motives of religion or by way of ornament march twenty eighth this morning a large herd of cattle arrived from the eastward and one of the drivers to whom ali had lent my horse came into my hut with the leg of an antelope as a present and told me that my horse was standing before ali's tent in a little time ali sent one of his slaves to inform me that in the afternoon i must be in readiness to ride out with him as he intended to show me to some of his women about four o'clock ali with six of his courtiers came riding to my hut and told me to follow them i readily complied but here a new difficulty occurred the moors accustomed to a loose and easy dress could not reconcile themselves to the appearance of my nankin breeches which they said were not only inelegant but on account of their tightness very indecent and as this was a visit to ladies ali ordered my boy to bring out the loose cloak which i had always worn since my arrival at benome and told me to wrap it close round me we visited the tents of four different ladies at every one of which i was presented with a bowl of milk and water all these ladies were remarkably corpulent which is considered here as the highest mark of beauty they were very inquisitive and examined my hair and skin with great attention but affected to consider me as a sort of inferior being to themselves and would knit their brows and seem to shudder when they looked at the whiteness of my skin the moors are certainly very good horsemen they ride without fear their saddles being high before and behind afford them a very secure seat and if they chance to fall the whole country is so soft and sandy that they are very seldom hurt their greatest pride and one of their principal amusements is to put the horse to its full speed and then stop him with a sudden jerk so as frequently to bring him down upon his haunches ali always rode upon a milk-white horse 
with its tail dyed red he never walked unless when he went to say his prayers and even in the night two or three horses were always kept ready saddled at a little distance from his own hut the moor set a very high value upon their horses for it is by their superior fleetness that they are enabled to make so many predatory excursions into the negro countries they feed them three or four times a day and generally give them a large quantity of sweet milk in the evening which the horses appear to relish very much april third this forenoon a child which had been some time sickly died in the next tent and the mother and relations immediately began the death howl they were joined by a number of female visitors who came on purpose to assist at the melancholy concert i had no opportunity of seeing the burial which is generally performed secretly in the dusk of the evening and frequently at only a few yards distance from the tent over the grave they plant one particular shrub and no stranger is allowed to pluck a leaf or even to touch it so great a veneration have they for the dead april seventh about four o'clock in the afternoon a whirlwind passed through the camp with such violence that it overturned three tents and blew down one side of my hut these whirlwinds come from the great desert and at this season of the year are so common that i have seen five or six of them at one time they carry up quantities of sand to an amazing height which resemble at a distance so many moving pillars of smoke the scorching heat of the sun upon a dry and sandy country makes the air insufferably hot ali having robbed me of my thermometer i had no means of forming a comparative judgment but in the middle of the day when the beams of the vertical sun are seconded by the scorching wind from the desert the ground is frequently heated to such a degree as not to be borne by the naked foot even the negro slaves will not run from one tent to another without their sandals at this time of the day the moors lie stretched at length in their tents either asleep or unwilling to move and i have often felt the wind so hot that i could not hold my hand in the current of air which came through the crevices of my hut without feeling sensible pain april eighth this day the wind blew from the southwest and in the night there was a heavy shower of rain accompanied with thunder and lightning april tenth in the evening the tabala or large drum was beat to announce a wedding which was held at one of the neighboring tents a great number of people of both sexes assembled but without that mirth and hilarity which takes place at a negro wedding here was neither singing nor dancing nor any other amusement that i could perceive a woman was beating the drum and the other women joining at times like a chorus by setting up sh a shrill scream and at the same time moving their tongues from one side of the mouth to the other with great clarity i was soon tired and had returned into my hut when i was sitting almost asleep when an old woman entered with a wooden bowl in her hand and signified that she had brought me a present from the bride before i could recover from the surprise which this message created the woman discharged the contents of the bowl full in my face finding that it was the same sort of holy water with which among the hottentots a priest is said to sprinkle a newly married couple i began to suspect that the old lady was actuated by mischiefs or malice but she gave me seriously to understand 
that it was a nuptial benediction from the bride's own person and which on such occasions is always received by the young unmarried moors as a mark of distinguished favor this being the case i wiped my face and sent my acknowledgments to the lady the wedding drum continued to beat and the women to sing or rather whistle all night about nine in the morning the bride was brought in state from her mother's tent attended by a number of women who carried her tent a present from the husband some bearing up the poles others holding by the strings and in this manner they marched whistling as formerly until they came to the place appointed for her residence where they pitched the tent the husband followed with a number of men leading four bullocks which they tied to the tent strings and having killed another and distributed the beef among the people the ceremony was concluded end of volume one chapter ten recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c volume one chapter eleven of travels in the interior of africa by mungo park this librivox recording is in the public domain sufferings in captivity one whole month had now elapsed since i was led into captivity during which time each returning day brought me fresh distresses i watched the lingering course of the sun with anxiety and blessed his evening beams as they shined a yellow lustre along the sandy floor of my hut for it was then that my impressors left me and allowed me to pass the sultry night in solitude and reflection about midnight a bowl of couscous with some salt and water were brought for me and my two attendants this was our common fare and it was all that was allowed us to allay the cravings of hunger and support nature for the whole of the following day for it is to be observed that this was the mohammedan lent and as the moors kept the fast with a religious strictness they thought it proper to compel me though a christian to similar observance time however somewhat reconciled me to my situation i found that i could bear hunger and thirst better than i expected and at length i endeavored to beguile the tedious hours by learning to write arabic april fourteenth as queen fatima had not yet arrived ali proposed to go to the north and bring her back with him but as the place was two days journey from benome it was necessary to have some refreshment on the road and ali suspicious of those about him was so afraid of being poisoned that he never ate anything but what was dressed under his own immediate inspection a fine bullock was therefore killed and the flesh being cut up into thin slices was dried in the sun and this with two bags of dry couscous formed his traveling provisions previous to his departure the black people of the town of benwan came according to their annual custom to show their arms and bring their stipulated tribute of corn and cloth they were but badly armed twenty-two with muskets forty or fifty with bows and arrows and nearly the same number of men and boys with spears only they arranged themselves before the tent where they waited until their arms were examined and some little disputes settled about midnight on the sixteenth ali departed quietly from benon accompanied by a few attendants he was expected to return in the course of nine or ten days april eighteenth two days after the departure of ali a sharif arrived with salt and some other articles from wallet the capital of the kingdom of beru 
as there was no tent appropriated for him he took up his abode in the same hut with me he seemed to be a well-informed man and his acquaintance both with the arabic and bambara tongues enabled him to travel with ease and safety through a number of kingdoms for though his place of residence was wallet he had visited Husa and had lived some years at timbuktu upon my inquiring so particularly about the distance from wallet to timbuktu he asked me if i intended to travel that way and being answered in the affirmative he shook his head and said it would not do for that christians were looked upon there as the devil's children and enemies to the prophet from him i learned the following particulars that hausa was the largest town he had ever seen that wallet was larger than timbuktu but being remote from the niger and its trading consistently chiefly of salt it was not so much resorted to by strangers that between benome and wallet was ten days journey but the road did not lead through any remarkable towns and travelers supported themselves by purchasing milk from the arabs who keep their herds by the watering places two of the day's journeys was over a sandy country without water from wallet to timbuktu was eleven days more but water was more plentiful and the journey was usually performed upon bullocks he said there were many jews at timbuktu but they all spoke arabic and used the same prayers as the moors he frequently pointed his hand to the southeast quarter or rather the east by south observing that timbuktu was situated in that direction and though i made him repeat this information again and again i never found him to vary more than half a point which was to the southward april twenty fourth this morning sharif sidi mohammed mora abdallah a native of morocco arrived with five bullocks loaded with salt he had formerly resided some months at gibraltar where he had picked up as much english as enabled him to make himself understood he informed me that he had been five months in coming from santa cruz but that great part of the time he had spent in trading when i requested him to enumerate the days employed in traveling from morocco to benome he gave them as follows to swara three days to agadir three days to jinikin ten to wadenom four to Lakenig five to ziriwin zirimani five to teshit ten to benone ten in all fifty days but travelers usually rest a long while at jinikin and teshit at the latter of which places they dig the rock salt which is so great an article of commerce with the negroes in conversing with the sharifs and the different strangers that resorted to the camp i passed my time with rather less uneasiness than formerly on the other hand as the dressing of my victuals was now left entirely to the care of ali's slaves over whom i had not the smallest control i found myself but ill supplied worse even than in the fast month for two successive nights they neglected to send us our accustomed meal and though my boy went to a small negro town near camp and begged with great diligence from hut to hut he could only procure a few handfuls of ground nuts which he readily shared with me we have been for some days in daily expectation of ali's return from sahil or the north country with his wife fatima in the meanwhile mansong king of bambara as i have related in chapter eight had sent 
to Ali for a party of horse to assist in storming Giogenguma. With this demand, Ali had not only refused to comply, but had treated the messengers with great haughtiness and contempt, upon which Masson gave up all thoughts of taking the town, and prepared to chastise Ali for his contumacy. Things were in this situation when, on the 29th of April, a messenger arrived at Benome with the disagreeable intelligence that the Bambara army was approaching the frontiers of Ludamar. This threw the whole country into confusion, and in the afternoon Ali's son, with about twenty horsemen, arrived at Benome. He ordered all the cattle to be driven away immediately, all the tents to be struck, and the people to hold themselves in readiness to depart at daylight the next morning. April 30th. At daybreak the whole camp was in motion. The baggage was carried upon bullocks, the two tent poles being placed one on each side, and the different wooden articles of the tent distributed in like manner. The tent cloth was thrown over all, and upon this was commonly placed one or two women, for the Moorish women are very bad walkers. The king's favorite concubines rode upon camels, with a saddle of a particular construction, and a canopy to shelter them from the sun. We proceeded to the northward until noon, when the king's son ordered the whole company, except the tents, to enter a thick, low wood which was upon our right. I was sent along with the two tents, and arrived in the evening at a negro town called Farani. Here we pitched the tents in an open place, at no great distance from the town. May 1st. As I had some reason to suspect that this day was also to be considered as a fast, I went in the morning to the negro town of Farani and begged some provisions from the duty, who readily supplied my wants, and desired me to come to his house every day during my stay in the neighborhood. These hospitable people are looked upon by the Moors and as an abject race of slaves, and are treated accordingly. May 3rd. We departed from the vicinity of Farandi, and after a circuitous route through the woods, arrived at Ali's camp in the afternoon. This encampment was larger than that of Benome, and was situated in the middle of a thick wood, about two miles distant from a negro town called Bubaker. I immediately waited upon Ali, in order to pay my respects to Queen Fatima, who had come with him from Sahil. He seemed much pleased with my coming, shook hands with me, and informed his wife that I was the Christian. She was a woman of the Arab caste, with long black hair and remarkable corpulent. She appeared at first rather shocked at the thought of having a Christian so near her, but when I had, by means of a negro boy who spoke the Mandingo and Arabic tongues, answered a great many questions which her curiosity suggested, respected the country of the Christians, she seemed more at ease, and presented me with a bowl of milk, which I considered as a very favorable omen. The heat was now almost insufferable. All nature seemed sinking under it. The distant country presented to the eye a dreary expanse of sand, with a few stunted trees and prickly bushes, in the shade of which the hungry cattle licked up the withered grass, while the camels and goats picked off the scanty foliage. The scarcity of water was greater here than at Benome, Day and night the wells were crowded with cattle, lowing and fighting with each other to come at the troughs. Excessive thirst made many of them furious. Others, being too weak to contend for the water, 
endeavored to quench their thirst by devouring the black mud from the gutters near the wells where they did with great avidity though it was commonly fatal to them one night having solicited in vain for water at the camp and being quite feverish i resolved to try my fortune at the wells which were about half a mile distant from the camp accordingly i set out about midnight and being guided by the lowering of the cattle soon arrived at the place where i found the moors very busy drawing water i requested permission to drink but was driven away with outrageous abuse passing however from one well to another i came at last to one where there was only an old man and two boys i made the same request to this man and he immediately drew me up a bucket of water but as i was about to take hold of it he recollected that i was a christian and fearing that his bucket might be polluted by my lips he dashed the water into the trough and told me to drink from thence though this trough was none of the largest and three cows were already drinking from it i resolved to come in for my share and kneeling down thrust my head between two of the cows and drank with great pleasure until the water was nearly exhausted and the cows began to contend with each other for the last mouthful in adventures of this nature i passed the sultry month of may during which no material change took place in my situation ali still considered me as a lawful prisoner and fatima though she allowed me a larger quantity of victuals than i had been accustomed to receiving at benome had as yet said nothing on the subject of my release in the meantime the frequent changes of the wind the gathering clouds and distant lightning with other appearances of approaching rain indicated that the wet season was at hand when the moors annually evacuate the country of the negroes and return to the skirts of the great desert this made me consider that my fate was drawing towards a crisis and i resolved to wait for the event without any seeming uneasiness but circumstances occurred which produced a change in my favor more suddenly than i had foreseen or had reason to expect the case was this the fugitive cartans who had taken refuge in ludamar as i have related in chapter eight finding that the moors were about to leave them and dreading the resentment of their own sovereign whom they had so basely deserted offered to treat with ali for two hundred moorish horsemen to cooperate with them in an effort to dispel daisy from jedding guma for until daisy should be vanquished or humbled they considered that they could neither return to their native towns nor live in security in any of the neighboring kingdoms with a view to extort money from these people by means of this treaty ali dispatched his son to jara and prepared to follow him in the course of a few days this was an opportunity of too great consequence to me to be neglected i immediately applied to fatima who i found had the chief direction in all affairs of state and begged her interest with ali to give me permission to accompany him to jara this request after some hesitation was favorably received fatima looked kindly on me and i believe was at length moved with compassion towards me my bundles were brought from the large cowskin bag that stood in the corner of ali's tent and i was ordered to explain the use of the different articles and show the method of putting on the boots stockings etc with all which i cheerfully complied and was told that in the course of a few days i should be at liberty to depart 
believing therefore that i should certainly find the means of escaping from jara if i should once get thither i now freely indulged the pleasing hope that my captivity would soon terminate and happily not having been disappointed in this idea i shall pause in this place to collect and bring in one point of view such observations on the moorish character and country as i had no fair opportunity of introducing into the preceding narrative end of volume one chapter eleven recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Volume 1, Chapter 12 of Travels in the Interior of Africa by Mungo Park. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Observations on the Character and Country of the Moors. The Moors of this part of Africa are divided into many separate tribes, of which the most formidable, according to what was reported to me, are those of Trazart and il bracken which inhabit the northern bank of the senegal river the tribes of gedemola jaffnu and ludamar though not so numerous as the former are nevertheless very powerful and warlike and are each governed by a chief or king who exercises absolute jurisdiction over his own horde without acknowledging the alliance to a common sovereign in times of peace the employment of the people is pasturage the moors indeed subsist chiefly on the flesh of their cattle and are always in the extreme of either gluttony or abstinence in consequence of the frequent and severe fasts which their religion enjoins and the toilsome journeys which they sometimes undertake across the desert they are enabled to bear both hunger and thirst with surprising fortitude but whenever opportunities occur of satisfying their appetite they generally devour more at one meal than would serve a european for three they pay but little attention to agriculture purchasing their corn cotton cloth and other necessities from the negroes in exchange for salt which they dig from the pits in the great desert the natural barrenness of the country is such that it furnishes but few materials for manufacture the moors however contrive to weave a strong cloth with which they cover their tents the thread is spun by the women from the hair of goats and they prepare the hides of their cattle so as to furnish saddles bridles pouches and other articles of leather they are likewise sufficiently skilful to convert the native iron which they procure from the negroes into spears and knives and also into pots for boiling their food but their sabers and other weapons as well as their firearms and ammunition they purchase from the europeans in exchange for the negro slaves which they obtain in their predatory excursions their chief commerce of this kind is with the french traders on the senegal river the moors are rigid mohammedans and possess with the bigotry and superstition all the intolerance of their sect they have no mosque at benom but perform their devotions in a sort of open shed or enclosure made of mats the priest is at the same time schoolmaster to the juniors his pupils assemble every evening before his tent where by the light of a large fire made of brushwood and cow's dung they are taught a few sentences from the koran and are initiated into the principles of their creed their alphabet differs but little from that in richardson's arabic grammar they always write with vowel points their priests even affect to know something of foreign literature the priest of benome assured me that he could read the writings of the christians 
he showed me a number of barbarous characters which he asserted were the roman alphabet and he produced another specimen equally unintelligible which he declared to be the calum il indi or persian his library consisted of nine volumes in quarto most of them i believe were books on religion for the name of mohammed appeared in red letters in almost every page of each his scholars wrote their lessons upon thin boards paper being too expensive for general use the boys were diligent enough and appeared to possess a considerable share of emulation carrying the boards slung over their shoulders went about their common employments when a boy has committed to memory a few of their prayers and can read and write certain parts of the koran he is reckoned sufficiently instructed and with this slender stock of learning commences his career of life proud of his acquirements he surveys with contempt the unlettered negro and embraces every opportunity of displaying his superiority over such of his countrymen as are not distinguished by the same accomplishments the education of the girls is neglected altogether mental accomplishments are but little attended to by the women nor is the want of them considered by the men as a defect in the female character they are regarded i believe as an inferior species of animals and seem to be brought up for no other purpose than that of administering to the sensual pleasures of their imperious masters voluptuousness is therefore considered as their chief accomplishment and slavish submission as their indispensable duty the moors have singular ideas of feminine perfection the gracefulness of figure and motion and a countenance enlivened by expression are by no means essential points in their standard with them corpulence and beauty appear to be terms nearly synonymous a woman of even moderate pretensions must be one who cannot walk without a slave under each arm to support her and a perfect beauty is a load for a camel in consequence of this prevalent taste for unwieldiness of bulk the moorish ladies take great pains to acquire it in early life and for this purpose many of the young girls are compelled by their mothers to devour a great quantity of couscous and drink a large bowl of camel's milk every morning it is of no importance whether the girl has an appetite or not the couscous and milk must be swallowed and obedience is frequently enforced by blows i have seen a poor girl crying with the bowl at her lips for more than an hour and her mother with a stick in her hand watching her all the while and using the stick without mercy whenever she observed that her daughter was not swallowing this singular practice instead of producing indigestion and disease soon covers the young lady with that degree of plumpness which in the eye of a moor is perfection itself as the moors purchase all their clothing from the negroes the women are forced to be very economical in the article of dress in general they content themselves with a broad piece of cloth and cloth which is wrapped round the middle and hangs down like a petticoat almost to the ground to the upper part of this are sewed two square pieces one before and the other behind which are fastened together over the shoulders the headdress is commonly a bandage of cloth and cloth with some parts of it broader than others which serve to conceal the face when they walk in the sun frequently however when they go abroad they veil themselves from head to foot the employment of the women varies according to their degrees of opulence queen fatima and a few others of a high rank like the great ladies in some parts of europe pass their time chiefly in conversing with their visitors 
performing their devotions or admiring their charms in the looking-glass the women of inferior class employ themselves in different domestic duties they are very vain and talkative and when anything puts them out of humor they commonly vent their anger upon their female slaves over whom they rule with severe and despotic authority which leads me to observe that the condition of these poor captives is deplorably wretched at daybreak they are compelled to fetch water from the wells in large skins called gerbas and as soon as they have brought water enough to serve the family for the day as well as the horses for the moors seldom give their horses the trouble of going to the wells they are then employed in pounding the corn and dressing the victuals this being always done in the open air the slaves are exposed to the combined heat of the sun the sand and the fire in the intervals it is their business to sweep the tent churn the milk and perform other domestic offices with all this they are badly fed and oftentimes cruelly punished the men's dress among the moors of ludamar differs but little from that of the negroes which has already been described except that they have all adopted that characteristic of the mohammedan sect the turban which is here universally made of white cotton cloth such of the moors as have long beards displayed them with a mixture of pride and satisfaction as denoting an arab ancestry of this number was ali himself but among the generality of the people the hair is short and busy and universally black and here i may be permitted to observe that if any one circumstance excited them favorable thoughts toward my own person it was my beard which was now grown to an enormous length and was always beheld with approbation or envy i believe my conscience they thought it too good a beard for a christian the only diseases which i observed to prevail among the moors were the intermittent fever and dysentery for the cure of which nostrums are sometimes administered by their old women but in general nature is left to her own operations mention was made to me of the smallpox as being sometimes very destructive but it had not to my knowledge made its appearance in ludamar while i was in captivity that it prevails however among some tribes of the moors and that it is frequently conveyed by them to the negroes in the southern states i was assured on the authority of dr Laidley, who also informed me that the negroes on the gambia practice inoculation the administration of criminal justice as far as i had opportunities of observing was prompt and decisive for although civil rights were but little regarded in ludamar it was necessary when crimes were committed that examples should sometimes be made on such occasions the offender was brought before ali who pronounced of his sole authority what judgment he thought proper but i understood that capital punishment was seldom or never inflicted except on the negroes although the wealth of the moors consists chiefly in their numerous herds of cattle yet as a pastoral life does not afford full employment the majority of the people are perfectly idle and spend the day in trifling conversation about their horses or in laying schemes of depredation on the negro villages of the number of ali's moor subjects i had no means of forming a correct estimate the military strength of ludamar consists in cavalry they are well mounted and appear to be very expert in skirmishing and attacking by surprise every soldier furnishes his own horse and finds his accumens consisting of a large sabre 
a double-barreled gun, a small red leather bag for holding his balls, and a powder bag slung over the shoulder. He has no pay, nor any remuneration, but what arises from plunder. This body is not very numerous. For when Ali made war upon Bambara, I was informed that his whole force did not exceed two thousand cavalry. They constitute, however, by what I could learn, but a very small proportion of his Moorish subjects. The horses are very beautiful, and so highly esteemed that the negro princes will sometimes give from twelve to fourteen slaves for one horse. Ludamar has, for its northern boundary, the great desert of Sahara. From the best inquiries I could make, this vast ocean of sand, which occupies so large a space in northern Africa, may be pronounced almost destitute of inhabitants, except where the scanty vegetation which appears in certain spots affords pasturage for the flocks of a few miserable Arabs, who wander from one well to another. In other places where the supply of water and pasturage is far more abundant small parties of the moors have taken up their residence here they live in independent poverty secure from the tyrannical government of barbary but the greater part of the desert being totally destitute of water is seldom visited by any human being unless where the trading caravans trace out their toilsome and dangerous route across it. In some parts of this extensive waste, the ground is covered with low stunted shrubs, which serve as landmarks for the caravans, and furnish the camels with scanty forage. In other parts of the disconsolate wanderer, wherever he turns, sees nothing around him but a vast interminable expanse of sand and sky a gloomy and barren void where the eye finds no particular object to rest upon and the mind is filled with painful apprehensions of perishing with thirst the few wild animals which inhabit these melancholy regions are the antelope and the ostrich their swiftness of foot enabling them to reach the distant watering places on the skirts of the desert where water is more plentiful are found lions panthers elephants and wild bears of domestic animals the only one that can endure the fatigue of crossing the desert is the camel by the particular conformation of the stomach he is enabled to carry a supply of water sufficient for ten or twelve days his broad and yielding foot is well adapted for a sandy country and by a singular motion of his upper lip he picks the smallest leaves from the thorny shrubs of the desert as he passes along the camel is therefore the only beast of burden employed by the trading caravans which traverse the desert in different directions from barbary to negrita as this useful and docile creature has been sufficiently described by systematical writers, it is unnecessary for me to enlarge upon his properties. I shall only add that his flesh, though to my own taste dry and unsavory, is preferred by the Moors to any other, and that the milk of the female is in universal esteem, and is indeed sweet, pleasant, and nutritive i have observed that the moors in their complexion resemble the mulattoes of the west indies but they have something unpleasant in their aspect which the mulattoes have not i fancied that i discovered in the features of most of them a disposition towards cruelty and low cunning and i could never contemplate their physiognomy without feeling sensible uneasiness from the staring wildness of their eyes a stranger would immediately set them down as a nation of lunatics 
the treachery and malevolence of their character are manifest in their plundering excursions against the negro villages oftentimes without the smallest provocation and sometimes under the fairest professions of friendship they will suddenly seize upon the negroes cattle and even on the inhabitants themselves the negroes very seldom retaliate like the roving arabs the moors frequently remove from one place to another according to the season of the year or the convenience of pasturage in the month of february when the heat of the sun scorches up every sort of vegetation in the desert they strike their tents and approach the negro country to the south where they reside until the rains commence in the month of july at this time having purchased corn and other necessities from the negroes in exchange for salt they again depart to the northward and continue in the desert until the rains are over and that part of the country becomes burnt up and barren this wandering and restless way of life which it inures them to hardships strengthens at the same time the bonds of their little society and creates in them an aversion towards strangers which is almost unsurmountable cut off from all intercourse with civilized nations and boasting an advantage over the negroes by possessing through a very limited degree the knowledge of letters they are at once the vainest and proudest and perhaps the most bigoted ferocious and intolerant of all the nations on the earth combining in their character the blind superstition of the negro with the savage cruelty and treachery of the arab end of volume one chapter twelve recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c volume one chapter thirteen of travels in the interior of africa by mungo park this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Escape from Captivity Having, as hath been related, obtained permission to accompany Ali to Jara, I took leave of Queen Fatima, who, with much grace and civility, returned me part of my apparel, and the evening before my departure, my horse, with the saddle and bridle, were sent me by ali's order early on the morning of the twenty sixth of may i departed from the camp of Bubaker, accompanied by my two attendants johnson and demba and a number of moors on horseback ali with about fifty horsemen having gone privately from the camp during the night we stopped about noon at forani and were there joined by twelve moors riding upon camels and with them we proceeded to a watering place in the woods where we overtook ali and his fifty horsemen they were lodged in some low shepherd's tents near the wells may twenty eighth early in the morning the moors saddled their horses and ali's chief slave ordered me to get in readiness in a little time the same messenger returned and taking my boy by the shoulder told him in the mandingo language that ali was to be his master in future and then turning to me the business is settled at last said he the boy and everything but your horse goes back to brubaker but you may take the old fool meaning johnson the interpreter with you to jara i made him no answer but being shocked beyond description at the idea of losing the poor boy i hastened to ali who was at breakfast before his tent surrounded by many of his courtiers i told him perhaps in rather too passionate a strain that whatever imprudence i had been guilty of in coming into his country I thought I had already been sufficiently punished for it 
by being so long detained and then plundered of all my little property which however gave me no uneasiness when compared with what he had just done now to me i observed that the boy whom he now seized upon was not a slave and had been accused of no offence he was indeed one of my attendants and his faithful services in that station had procured him his freedom his fidelity and attachment had made him follow me into my present situation and as he looked up to me for protection i could not see him deprived of his liberty without remonstrating against such an act as the height of cruelty and injustice ali made no reply but with a haughty air and malignant smile told his interpreter that if i did not mount my horse immediately he would send me back likewise there is something in the frown of a tyrant which rouses the most secret emotions of the heart i could not suppress my feelings and for once entertained an indignant wish to rid the world of such a monster poor demba was no less affected than myself he had formed a strong attachment towards me and had a cheerfulness of disposition which often beguiled the tedious hours of captivity he was likewise a proficient in the bambara tongue and promised on that account to be of great utility to me in future but it was in vain to expect anything favourable to humanity from people who are strangers to his dictates so having shaken hands with this unfortunate boy and blended my tears with his assuring him however that i would do my utmost to redeem him i saw him led off by three of ali's slaves towards the camp at brubaker when the moors had mounted their horses i was ordered to follow them and after a toilsome journey through the woods in a very sultry day we arrived in the afternoon at a walled village called dumbani where we remained two days waiting for the arrival of some horsemen from the northward on the first of june we departed from dumbani towards jera our company now amounted to two hundred men all on horseback for the moors never use infantry in their wars they appeared capable of enduring great fatigue but from their total want of discipline our journey to jera was more like fox chase than the march of an army at jera i took my lodging at the house of my old acquaintance damon jumba and informed him of everything that had befallen me i particularly requested him to use his interest with ali to redeem my boy and promised him a bill upon dr laidley for the value of two slaves the moment he brought him to jera damon very readily undertook to negotiate the business but found that ali considered the boy as my principal interpreter and was unwilling to part with him lest he should fall a second time into my hands and be instrumental in conducting me to bambara ali therefore put off the matter from day to day but withal told damon that if he wished to purchase the boy for himself he should have him thereafter at the common price of a slave which damon agreed to pay for him whenever ali should send him to jara the chief object of ali in this journey to jara as i have already related was to procure money from such as the cartans as had taken refuge in his country some of these had solicited his protection to avoid the horrors of war but by far the greatest number of them were dissatisfied men who wished the ruin of their own sovereign these people no sooner heard that 
the bambara army had returned to sago without subduing daisy as was generally expected then they resolved to make a sudden attack themselves upon him before he could recruit his forces which were now known to be much diminished by a bloody campaign and in great want of provisions with this view they solicited the moors to join them and offered to hire of ali two hundred horsemen which ali with the warmest professions of friendship agreed to furnish upon condition that they should previously supply him with four hundred head of cattle two hundred garments of blue cloth and a considerable quantity of beads and ornaments june eighth in the afternoon ali sent his chief slave to inform me that he was about to return to brew baker but as he would only stay there a few days to keep the approaching festival bana sali and then return to jara i had permission to remain with damon until his return this was joyful news to me but i had experienced so many disappointments that i was unwilling to indulge the hope of its being true until johnson came and told me that ali with part of the horsemen were actually gone from the town and that the rest were to follow him in the morning june ninth early in the morning the remainder of the moors departed from town they had during their stay committed many acts of robbery and this morning with the most unparalleled audacity they seized upon three girls who were bringing water from the wells and carried them away into slavery june twelfth two people dreadfully wounded were discovered at a watering place in the woods one of them had just breathed his last but the other was brought alive to jera on recovering a little he informed the people that he had fled through the woods from casson that daisy had made war upon sambo the king of that country had surprised three of his towns and put all the inhabitants to the sword he enumerated by name many of the friends of the jara people who had been murdered in casson this intelligence made the death howl universal in jara for the space of two days this piece of bad news was followed by another not less distressing a number of runaway slaves arrived from carta on the fourteenth and reported that daisy having received information concerning the intended attack upon him was about to visit jara this made the negroes call upon ali for the two hundred horsemen which he was to furnish them according to engagement but ali paid very little attention to their remonstrances, and at last plainly told them that his cavalry were otherwise employed the negroes thus deserted by the moors and fully apprised that the king of carta would show them as little clemency as he had shown the inhabitants of casson resolved to collect all their forces and hazard a battle before the king who was now in great distress for want of provisions should become too powerful for them they therefore assembled about eight hundred effective men in the whole and with these they entered carta on the evening of the eighteenth of june june nineteenth this morning the wind shifted to the southwest and about two o'clock in the afternoon we had a heavy tornado or thunder squall accompanied with rain which greatly revived the face of nature and gave a pleasant coolness to the air this was the first rain that had fallen for many months as every attempt to redeem my boy had hitherto been unsuccessful and in all probability would continue to prove so 
whilst i remained in the country i found that it was necessary for me to come to some determination concerning my own safety before the rain should be fully set in for my landlord seeing no likelihood of being paid for his trouble began to wish me away and johnson my interpreter refusing to proceed my situation became very perplexing i determined to avail myself of the first opportunity of escaping and to proceed directly for bambara as soon as the rains had set in for a few days so as to afford me the certainty of finding water in the woods such was my situation when on the evening of the twenty fourth of june i was startled by the report of some muskets close to the town and inquiring the reason was informed that the jara army had returned from fighting daisy and that this firing was by way of rejoicing however when the chief men of the town had assembled and heard a full detail of the expedition they were by no means relieved from their uneasiness on daisy's account the deceitful moors having drawn back from the confederacy after being hired by the negroes greatly dispirited the insurgents who instead of finding daisy with a few friends concealed in the strong fortress of gedogenoma had found him at a town near joka in the open country surrounded by so numerous an army that every attempt to attack him was at once given up and the confederates only thought of enriching themselves by the plunder of the small towns in the neighborhood they accordingly fell upon one of daisy's towns and carried off the whole of the inhabitants but less intelligence of this might reach daisy and induce him to cut off their retreat they returned through the woods by night bringing with them the slaves and cattle which they had captured june twenty sixth this afternoon a spy from carta brought the alarming intelligence that daisy had taken simbing in the morning and would be in jara some time in the course of the ensuing day early in the morning nearly one half of the town's people took the road for bambara by the way of dina their departure was very affecting the women and children crying the men sullen and dejected and all of them looking back with regret on their native town and on the wells and rocks beyond which their ambition had never tempted them to stray where they had laid all their plans of future happiness all of which they were now forced to abandon and to seek shelter among strangers june twenty seventh about eleven o'clock in the forenoon we were alarmed by the sentinels who brought information that daisy was on his march towards jera and that the confederate army had fled before him without firing a gun the terror of the townspeople on this occasion is not easily to be described indeed the screams of the women and children and the great hurry and confusion that everywhere prevailed made me suspect that the cartans had already entered the town and although i had every reason to be pleased with daisy's behavior to me when i was at camu i had no wish to expose myself to the mercy of his army who might in the general confusion mistake me for a moor i therefore mounted my horse and taking a large bag of corn before me rode slowly along with the townspeople until we reached the foot of a rocky hill where i dismounted and drove my horse up before me when i had reached the summit i sat down and having a full view of the town and the neighboring country could not help lamenting the situation of the poor inhabitants 
who were thronging after me driving their sheep cows goats etc and carrying a scanty portion of provisions and a few clothes there was a great noise and crying everywhere upon the road for many aged people and children were unable to walk and these with the sick were obliged to be carried otherwise they must have been left to certain destruction about five o'clock we arrived at a small farm belonging to the jara people called kajia and here i found damon and johnson employed in filling large bags of corn to be carried upon bullocks to serve as provisions for damon's family on the road june twenty eighth at daybreak we departed from kajia and having passed trongobana without stopping arrived in the afternoon at quira i remained here two days in order to recruit my horse which the moors had reduced to a perfect rosiante and to wait for the arrival of some mandingo negroes who were going for bambara in the course of a few days on the afternoon of the first of july as i was tending my horse in the fields ali chief slave and four moors arrived at quira and took up their lodging at the duty's house my interpreter johnson who suspected the nature of this visit sent two boys to overhear their conversation from which he learnt that they were sent to convey me back to brubaker the same evening two of the moors came privately to look at my horse and one of them proposed taking it to the duty's hut but the other observed that such a precaution was unnecessary as i could never escape upon such an animal they then inquired where i slept and returned to their companions all this was like a stroke of thunder to me for i dreaded nothing so much as confinement again among the moors from whose barbarity i had nothing but death to expect i therefore determined to set off immediately for bambara a measure which i thought offered almost the only chance of saving my life and gaining the object of my mission i communicated the design to johnson who although he applauded my resolution was so far from showing any inclination to accompany me that he solemnly protested he would rather forfeit his wages than go any farther he told me that damon had agreed to give him half the price of a slave for his service to assist in conducting a coffle of slaves to gambia and that he was determined to embrace the opportunity of returning to his wife and family having no hopes therefore of persuading him to accompany me i resolved to proceed by myself about midnight i got my clothes in readiness which consisted of two shirts two pairs of trousers two pocket handkerchiefs an upper and under waistcoat a mat and a pair of half boots these with a cloak constituted my whole wardrobe and i had not one single bead or any other article of value in my possession to purchase victuals for myself or corn for my horse about daybreak johnson who had been listening to the moors all night came and whispered to me that they were asleep the awful crisis was now arrived when i was again either to taste the blessing of freedom or languish out my days in captivity a cold sweat moistened my forehead as i thought on the dreadful alternative and reflected that one way or another my fate must be decided in the course of the ensuing day but to deliberate was to lose the only chance of escaping so taking up my bundle i stepped gently over the negroes who were sleeping in the open air and having mounted my horse i bade johnson farewell 
desiring him to take particular care of the papers i had entrusted him with and inform my friends in gambia that he had left me in good health on my way to bambara i proceeded with great caution surveying each bush and frequently listening and looking behind me for the moorish horsemen until i was about a mile from the town when i was surprised to find myself in the neighbourhood of a corrie belonging to the moors the shepherds followed me for about a mile hooting and throwing stones after me and when i was out of their reach and had begun to indulge the pleasing hope of escaping i was again greatly alarmed to hear somebody hola behind me and looking back i saw three moors on horseback coming after me at full speed whooping and brandishing their double-barreled guns i knew it was in vain to think of escaping and therefore turned back and met them when two of them caught hold of my bridle one on each side and the third presenting his musket told me i must go back to ali when the human mind has for some time been fluctuating between hope and despair tortured with anxiety and hurried from one extreme to the other it affords a sort of gloomy relief to know the worst that can possibly happen such was my situation an indifference about life and all its enjoyments had completely benumbed my faculties and i rode back with the moors with apparent unconcern but a change took place much sooner than i had any reason to expect in passing through some thick bushes one of the moors ordered me to untie my bundle and show them the contents having examined the different articles they found nothing worth taking except my cloak which they considered a very valuable acquisition and one of them pulling it from me wrapped it about himself and with one of his companions rode off with their prize when i attempted to follow them the third who had remained with me struck my horse over the head and presenting his musket told me i should proceed no farther i now perceived that these men had not been sent by any authority to apprehend me but had pursued me solely with a view to rob and plunder me turning my horse's head therefore once more toward the east and observing the moor follow the tracks of his confederates i congratulated myself on having escaped with my life though in great distress from such a horde of barbarians i was no sooner out of the sight of the moor than i struck into the woods to prevent being pursued and kept pushing on with all possible speed until i found myself near some high rocks which i remembered to have seen in my former route from quira to dina and directing my course a little to the northward i fortunately fell in with the path end of volume one chapter thirteen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c volume one chapter fourteen of travels in the interior of africa by mungo park this librivox recording is in the public domain journey continued arrival at wara it is impossible to describe the joy that arose in my mind when i looked around and concluded that i was out of danger i felt like one recovered from sickness i breathed freer i found unusual lightness in my limbs even the desert looked pleasant and i dreaded nothing so much as falling in with some wandering parties of moors who might convey me back to the land of thieves and murderers from which i had just escaped i soon became sensible however that my situation was very deplorable for i had no means of procuring food nor prospect of finding water 
about ten o'clock perceiving a herd of goats feeding close to the road i took a circuitous route to avoid being seen and continued travelling through the wilderness directing my course by compass nearly east southeast in order to reach as soon as possible some town or village of the kingdom of bambara a little after noon when the burning heat of the sun was reflected with double violence from the hot sand and the distant ridges of the hills seen through the ascending vapour seemed to wave and fluctuate like the unsettled sea i became faint with thirst and climbed a tree in hopes of seeing distant smoke or some other appearance of human habitation but in vain nothing appeared all around but thick underwood and hillocks of white sand about four o'clock i came suddenly upon a large herd of goats and pulling my horse into a bush i watched to observe if the keepers were moors or negroes in a little time i perceived two moorish boys and with some difficulty persuaded them to approach me they informed me that the herd belonged to ali and that they were going to dina where the water was more plentiful and where they intended to stay until the rain had filled the pools in the desert they showed me their empty water skins and told me that they had seen no water in the woods this account afforded me but little consolation however it was in vain to repine and i pushed on as fast as possible in hopes of reaching some watering place in the course of the night my thirst was by this time becoming insufferable my mouth was parched and inflamed a sudden dimness would frequently come over my eyes with other symptoms of fainting and my horse being very much fatigued i began seriously to apprehend that i should perish of thirst to relieve the burning pain in my mouth and throat i chewed the leaves of different shrubs but found them all bitter and of no service to me a little before sunset having reached the top of a gentle rising i climbed a high tree from the topmost branches of which i cast a melancholy look over the barren wilderness but without discovering the most distant trace of a human dwelling the same dismal uniformity of shrubs and sand everywhere presented itself and the horizon was a, as level and uninterrupted as that of the sea descending from the tree i found my horse devouring the stubble and brushwood with great avidity and as i was now too faint to attempt walking and my horse too much fatigued to carry me i thought it but an act of humanity and perhaps the last i should ever have in my power to perform to take off his bridle and let him shift for himself in doing what i was suddenly affected with sickness and giddiness and falling upon the sand felt as if the hour of death was fast approaching here then thought i after a short but ineffectual struggle terminate all my hopes of being useful in my day and generation here must the short span of my life come to an end i cast as i believed a last look on the surrounding scene and whilst i reflected on the awful change that was about to take place this world with its enjoyment seemed to vanish from my recollection nature however at length resumed its functions and on recovering my senses i found myself stretched upon the sand with the bridle still in my hand and the sun just sinking behind the trees i now summoned all my resolution and determined to make another effort to prolong my existence and as the evening was somewhat cool i resolved to travel as far as my limbs would carry me in hopes of reaching my only resource a watering-place 
with this view i put the bridle on my horse and driving him before me went slowly along for about an hour when i perceived some lightning from the northeast a most delightful sight for it promised rain the darkness and lightning increased very rapidly and in less than an hour i heard the wind roaring among the bushes i had already opened my mouth to receive the refreshing drops which i expected but i was instantly covered with a cloud of sand driven with such a force by the wind as to give a very disagreeable sensation to my face and arms and i was obliged to mount my horse and stop under a bush to prevent being suffocated the sand continued to fly in amazing quantities for nearly an hour after which i again set forward and travelled with difficulty until ten o'clock about this time i was agreeably surprised by some very vivid flashes of lightning followed by a few heavy drops of rain in a little time the sand ceased to fly and i alighted and spread out all my clean clothes to collect the rain which at length i saw would certainly fall for more than an hour it rained plentifully and i quenched my thirst by wringing and sucking my clothes there being no moon it was remarkably dark so that i was obliged to lead my horse and direct my way by the compass which the lightning enabled me to observe in this manner i travelled with tolerable expectation until past midnight when the lightning becoming more distant i was under the necessity of groping along to the no small danger of my hands and eyes about two o'clock my horse started at something and looking round i was not a little surprised to see a light at a short distance among the trees and supposing it be a town i groped along the sand in hopes of finding cornstalks cotton or other appearances of cultivation but found none as i approached i perceived a number of other lights in different places and began to suspect that i had fallen upon a party of moors however in my present situation i was resolved to see who they were if i could do it with safety i accordingly led my horse cautiously towards the light and heard by the lowing of the cattle and the clamorous tongues of the herdsmen that it was a watering place and most likely belonged to the moors delightful as the sound of a human voice was to me i resolved once more to strike into the woods and rather run the risk of perishing of hunger than to trust myself again in their hands but being still thirsty and dreading the approach of the burning day i thought it prudent to search for the wells which i expected to find at no great distance in this purpose i inadvertently approached so near to one of the tents as to be perceived by a woman who immediately screamed out two people came running to her assistance from some of the neighbouring tents and passed so very near to me that i thought i was discovered and hastened again into the woods about a mile from this place i heard a loud and confused noise somewhere to the right of my course and in a short time was happy to find it was the croaking of frogs which was heavenly music to my ears i followed the sound and at daybreak arrived at some shallow muddy pools so full of frogs that it was difficult to discern the water the noise they made frightened my horse and i was obliged to keep them quiet by beating the water with a branch until he had drunk having here quenched my thirst i ascended a tree and the morning being calm i soon perceived the smoke of the watering place which i had passed in the night and observed another pillar of smoke east south east distant twelve or fourteen miles towards this i directed my route and reached the cultivated ground 
a little before eleven o'clock where seeing a number of negroes at work planting corn i inquired the name of the town and was informed that it was a fula village belonging to ali called shrilla i had now some doubts about entering it but my horse being very much fatigued and the day growing hot not to mention the pangs of hunger which began to assail me i resolved to venture and accordingly rode up to the duty's house where i was unfortunately denied admittance and could not obtain even a handful of corn either for myself or horse turning from this inhospitable door i rode slowly out of the town and perceiving some low scattered huts without walls i directed my route towards them knowing that in africa as well as in europe hospitality does not always prefer the highest dwellings at the door of one of these huts an old motherly-looking woman sat spinning cotton i made signs to her that i was hungry and inquired if she had any victuals with her in the hut she immediately laid down her distaff and desired me in arabic to come in when i had seated myself upon the floor she set before me a dish of couscous that had been left the preceding night of which i made a tolerable meal and in return for this kindness i gave her one of my pocket handkerchiefs begging at the same time a little corn for my horse which she readily brought me whilst my horse was feeding the people began to assemble and one of them whispered something to my hostess which very much excited her surprise though i was not well acquainted with the fula language i soon discovered that some of the men wished to apprehend and carry me back to ali in hopes i suppose of receiving a reward i therefore tied up the corn and lest any one should suspect i had run away from the moors i took northerly direction and went cheerfully along driving my horse before me followed by all the boys and girls of the town when i had travelled about two miles and got quit of all my troublesome attendants i struck again into the woods and took shelter under a large tree where i found it necessary to rest myself a bundle of twigs serving me for a bed and my saddle for a pillow july fourth at daybreak i pursued my course through the woods as formerly saw numbers of antelopes wild hogs and ostriches but the soil was more hilly and not so fertile as i have found it the preceding day about eleven o'clock i ascended an eminence where i climbed a tree and discovered at about eight miles distance an open part of the country with several red spots which i concluded were cultivated land and directing my course that way came to the precincts of a watering place about one o'clock from the appearance of the place i judged it to belong to the fulas and was hopeful that i should meet a better reception than i had experienced at shrilla in this i was not deceived for one of the shepherds invited me to come into his tent and partake of some dates this was one of those low fula tents in which there is room just sufficient to sit upright and in which the family the furniture etc seemed huddled together like so many articles in a chest when i had crept upon my hands and knees into this humble habitation i found that it contained a woman and three children who together with the shepherd and myself completely occupied the floor a dish of boiled corn and dates was produced and the master of the family as is customary in this part of the country first tasted it himself and then desired me to follow his example whilst i was eating 
the children kept their eyes fixed upon me and no sooner did the shepherd pronounce the word nazanari than they began to cry and their mother crept slowly towards the door out of which she sprang like a greyhound and was instantly followed by her children so frightened were they at the very name of a christian that no entreaties could induce them to approach the tent here i purchased some corn for my horse in exchange for some brass buttons and having thanked the shepherd for his hospitality struck again into the woods at sunset i came to a road that took the direction for bambera and resolved to follow it for the night but about eight o'clock hearing some people coming from the southward i thought it prudent to hide myself among some thick bushes near the road as these thickets are generally full of wild beasts i found my situation rather unpleasant sitting in the dark holding my horse by the nose with both hands to prevent him from neighing and equally afraid of the natives without and the wild beasts within my fears however were soon dissipated for the people after looking round the thicket and perceiving nothing went away and i hastened to the more open parts of the wood where i pursued my journey east southeast until past midnight when the joyful cry of frogs induced me once more to deviate a little from my route in order to quench my thirst having accomplished this from a large pool of rainwater i sought for an open place with a single tree in the midst under which i made my bed for the night i was disturbed by some wolves towards morning which induced me to set forward a little before day and having passed a small village called wasilita i came about ten o'clock july fifth to a negro town called walra which properly belongs to carta but was at this time tributary to mansong king of bambara end of volume one chapter fourteen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c